Dasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambu Dasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambu Dasa Sadhu 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 Sound like such a little voice today. It's from the rain. It gets my voice very high. <coughs> you have to find Frank. Frank has to come back. <coughs> the bass player. Okay. Now, this lesson has a history. <laughs> and I want you to know from the start, your lessons will not ever be this long anymore. <laughs> And I think I would like your comments when we go through this whole thing. Uh, I would like to hear from you because I think this is so large now, probably it should have been divided into two classes. But the problem I face with it is you're talking about the Four Noble Truths and when you start to do that, you wanna have them in one piece uh, when you, I'm teaching you from the um, angle of your meditation. Now, everything that we do here, so that you try to remember this, because I used to forget it, um, is that when we're talking to you and teaching you from uh, our perspective at Damatsuka, Bhante exclaimed once, you know, this Buddha only had one job in his whole life one profession and Siddhartha only had one job first he went into training for six years and he came out the other end as a master meditation teacher as a Buddha people like to talk about this is person who taught this and taught that and taught this and taught that and he has all this big wisdom but what we forget when we're looking at Buddhism is that because he is a master meditation teacher, because that's who he is, how he thinks, what he became as the Buddha and when he decided to teach, what did he teach and why? And you have someone who became a Buddha and decides to teach Buddhism, what does it mean? He actually taught the Buddha Dhamma, always remember that. He didn't teach Buddhism. Buddhism is the name of the religion. Buddha Dhamma is the name of what it is that this Buddha taught, okay? The teaching of Buddha Gautama. Having said that, it makes a big difference when you go to study the suttas, if you are always keeping in mind, this is a meditation teacher when he goes to a village to solve a problem the community has, or he goes and sits down with two generals and stops a war from happening, or he goes to two kings and stops them two kingdoms from fighting. You know, he's always doing it, always approaching it, and always solving it using the Four Noble Truths. So it, when he said that, I had to stop and we had time, you know, over the years, we have times in set pieces of uh, time to do things over the last 20 years. And so it's taking a year to figure something out is nothing. You know? and, and I spent at least a year rattling around with this, trying to figure out what are the Four Noble Truths is one question. But the other question, when we got into sections of the Majjhima Nikaya, which explained blow by blow the part, every single part of suffering. And he didn't leave anything out. Mental suffering, physical suffering, all the parts, definitions for everything. We don't need to be making up this stuff again. We need to be going back to the text and finding out what he said precisely before we mutilate it and change it with our own personal words. And the, the, the uh, Four Noble Truths themselves are being terribly victimized at this time, but don't let me go too far off on that when we start through this document. 
This document turned out to be twice the size it was supposed to be. But if uh, you get go along with me to get through this, I hope you have a pen and paper. I hope that you will write down and notate what's notated through it because it's going to show you where things are verified from as we go along. And if you have questions, wave to me <laughs> while I'm doing this and we'll pick at something if you just don't get it. If I use a word you do not understand, I wish I could tell you to this and we'll stop for a second and we'll look more closely to make sure we understand what the phrases mean. Why did we choose Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation? Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation was one of the first pronounced translations that occurred in 1995. It's the one that Bhante used when he took it to Thailand and went in the cave and went through the whole book and changed the way he was teaching completely. It's the one that when we start examining it next to other uh, translations later on after we've really gone through that one very hard, we find out that it was very practical and we call it the working translation. There are other translations, but they don't work with people. If we start to teach this one or that one, people don't get it. It doesn't seem to connect. Part of the issue is the compartmentalization that happened in the main commentary, taking pieces and teaching them so separated that you never got that the seven enlightenment factors were actually connected. You never figured out that the five uh, faculties and the five powers are causally related. You never figured out that even the four foundations of mindfulness are causally related. You never figured it out because when you studied it, you studied only this, only that, only this, and only that, but they never went like this. And what we found out was if you can weave certain parts together permanently in your mind, then your, your practice goes zoom, <laughs> zoom like that. It just takes off and you have all these wonderful insights that you hear and understand. Also, when you're working with the Majima Nikaya, I may have told you this, you may not have heard it. I spent some time, because we were stuck in Russia for 12 hours almost on a in-between flight thing. And we went through the whole entire Majima Nikaya and he knew exactly which ones we draw from. So out of 152, about 76 of those suttas have information that's valuable for meditation. The other ones are different kinds of things that happened, okay? Out of the 76, there's 22 that we narrowed it down are the most valuable for you to be able to feed your practice. So we even started to have a, um, a flashcard game <laughs> of the number of the sutta, the title of the sutta in Pali and in English, and if you could tell us what it was about in relation to your meditation you got five points. And we played this game and tried to memorize these 22 suttas at one point. It was fun. David told us, oh, I can't do that. It's way too difficult. And then we teased him until he had to try. And honestly, any kind of Buddhist trivia, you need to take David Johnson with you because he's going to get 100 on it's his turn. He knows everything because he was taking all the films of Bhante for the last 10 years. He's, in, he's right there listening all the time. And he said, oh, I can't do that. And he said, it's nine, it's Samaditi. It's about right uh, view. And this is what we get out of it for our practice. And he knew all the answers. You know, it's number 10. What's number 10? Satipatthana Sutta, you know, four foundations of mindfulness. This is what it's about, you see? And 148, Chachaka Sutta. What's it about? Chachaka is six sets of six, okay? And it's basically about teaching you 
anatta teaching. And sometimes they miss it. They write whole books about it and they never even mention anatta. And anatta is what? Anatta, the opposite of atta, is the, the antidote. It's the escape from the suffering. You switch your mind and don't take it personally. Don't get upset. And you choose to use the right effort properly. You have to do it correctly. I just heard a, a Sunday school uh, lesson taught last week and they didn't present it correctly. And I talked to somebody today and I said, you know, it's always rolling around in my head. How did it get lost? You see the last three of the folds on the eightfold path are very importantly about your practice. It is the right effort, the, mind, the uh, right mindfulness, and the right concentration. So we say harmonious practice, harmonious observation, harmonious collectedness of mind. We mean the first page of the Vasudhimaga in the concentration section saying productive level of concentration. But don't read the next two pages. <laughs> Because the next two pages, they, they sank the boat, <laughs> okay? And they have you thinking you have to fight with the, the hindrance and you have to, uh, as we say, uh, you know, um, destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suppress it, subdue it, make it stop. Well, what is this Atta training? What is this? It's a pure form of atta training. I have to do this. I have to make it stop. I have to control. Control. There's two kinds of control. Do you ever notice that if you try to control driving a big truck and you've never driven one before that you can't control it? You might be able to follow the shifts on the big stick inside the big heavy truck with the compound gear that's hauling 4,000 pounds. But if you get on a hill, you're in big trouble because you don't know what to do because you don't really have the knowledge about how it works. Isn't that right? Well, in meditation, this is the same thing with hindrances. People struggle because a commentary said all of this, but obviously the commentator wasn't a practitioner or he never got very far if he was, or he got there accidentally one day, he slipped off, stopped trying and fell into something good, but he could not make gradual steady progress because he didn't know how the hindrances work. This is the problems we run into. This is why people are doing what they're doing. And the only reason they don't know what's going on with the hindrances is because they never went and asked the Buddha exactly how do they work? What is their nutriment? What feeds them? What if we withdraw their supply line? They can't attack us anymore. What is all that? What if you knew that, just like the truck? If you know how to drive that truck, you don't have any trouble downshifting and keeping yourself from going off a cliff. And if you know how a hindrance operates, then you will understand, okay, that it's not so hard and you personally don't have to make it happen because of the Nietzsche, it's gonna fade away anyway. So we're all confused about the object and thing. Okay, so all of this is about the practice. We're gonna dive into this. Don't ask me how long this is gonna take. And if it goes way too long, what we'll do is we'll have to break it off and do another part of it. But I think that we can get through it. But like I said, keep your pens, your paper out. You're gonna get a lot of good uh, information from this as you're going on, okay? So I'm gonna to try to go to the screen and get uh, in line with this. There's a few documents here, let's see. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you something wonderful first. This is really nice. This came this week to us. And it's just really nice because this is someone who is here in India and they sent us this beautiful comment. I have been meditating with twin method since I discovered it a couple months ago. So only two months, right? It's been a very powerful and peace filled method for me. And in the past I tried other meditation techniques 
They didn't work for me because of the heavy focus on the concentration, but Bhante Vimal Ramsey's twin approach, it felt just like, just right to me. I also found useful resources on the website with the books and talks that have aided the understanding of the path. And I found an exposition on the dependent origination that was helpful. That's the one online, the dependent origination workshop. And just wanted to thank us, but this is really fun. And now he's coming to talk about back injuries, which he's very fortunate. I know all about them. <laughs> so I can help him to understand maybe what we can uh, do with this. Now, I always have to figure out where I go from here. I'm going to go like that. Okay. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, no, save. Okay. Now we go to the next one of these. No, I don't go save. I just say. <laughs> I'm trying to, don't say, hi. Okay, here you come. All right, good. Now we start again. Now we go back over here. Now we're gonna look at um, the document. Okay. So the question is, in, instead of leaving it as just talking about um, a second part of Bhavana, I'm just gonna say, this used to be called Bhavana part two. And I'm just gonna to say to you at this point, from here on out, everything that you are learning is going to be part of your bhavana from this moment forward. And what happened is we said bhavana part two, and the whole thing was about the Four Noble Truths. So now we're naming it, what are the Four Noble Truths and how are they used? How were they used by the Buddha? What actually, Q is here, good old Q, what actually were the four noble truths that were unearthed by the Buddha? The truths are more than what you would suspect. This is what's really cool. They are useful tools that we uh, go upon, as we go upon on our own quest for a solution for suffering. So they are a summary of the Buddha Dhamma. They, everybody knows that one. They run it, you run into it all the time. The second one, they are the Buddha's steps for investigation and meditation. We're going to look at that. They're a teaching method for lesson construction when you teach. You wanna be a successful speaker in anything you do in life and talk about, learn how to use these four steps when you build your talk. And if you do that, you'll be successful. They are a teaching method for the lesson construction. Uh, they are also his communication and reconciliation plan that he uses in a lot of the stories, a lot of the solutions he comes to in story suttas that are there are about problems where he was consulted and he becomes known as the master peacemaker. And then if you can think of any more uses as we go along, you can send them to me in the email because I'm always looking for another angle of saying something outside of those. And then the four noble truths are basically uh, the summary of the Buddha Dhamma. And when we look at those, it's simple. It started out simple. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering is the second one. There is a cessation of suffering is the third. There is a path to the cessation of suffering, that's the fourth. Now, this is a very simple summary of the Buddhist teaching that's based on Siddhartha Gautama's quest results. The sentences as you see them here are what we call, they're designed to invite you and me to get more curious and repeat his discovery for ourselves. That's what they are. They are not original, the original statements, if they do not appear to be on an invitation. This is, I cannot stress this to you enough. Why am I saying this? Because in modern writing today, some actually Mahatera monks, I, we don't know where it happened, we're pretty sure, I'm, I'm very firm about this. This was not an English speaking person that did this. This had to be, a, um, it could have been, but I doubt it. It had to more likely be a monk using English as a second language. 
because of what they said to me in Japan about this. They said there's no difference in what I'm about to say to you and what this says. I'm just going to say it. We're not going to go beyond that because the discussion and it can take all night. Instead of saying there is suffering, we might find them to say, all of life is suffering. And that's not what this said. What this one said was there is suffering in life. So this one is an open-ended statement, but the other one is a closed statement. And if you're a teenager and you're smart and you see that at the front door, don't bother going there to find a spiritual solution. That's the message it sends. Okay, but this one makes you curious. You wanna know what it is. Second one, there is a cause for suffering. The, the uh, change in that one was the cause of suffering is desire, period. Problem, why is there a problem with this? There's a problem because there is wholesome and unwholesome desire in your life. If you're looking at this um, as an advanced meditator and a monk who's about to go to Nibbana, maybe we could look at it. <laughs> as a, somebody coming in the front door who wants to use Buddhism in their life, this is nonsense. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to succeed at your job? Do you want to succeed? Do you desire to succeed uh, with your marriage, your relationships, your children, your dreams, your goals, all of that as, an, as a normal person in life? Do you? If you do, then we have to declare very clearly after we say that, don't we, that there are such things as unwholesome desire, which Buddhism was against, and wholesome desire, which is not a bad thing to make more of for yourself in life as a lay person to be successful. You see the difference? The third one is there is a cessation of suffering. He's declaring if there is one, he experienced there was one in human beings, he watched it happen. So that's what this was about. When we changed that one, it came out this way. <laughs> to reach the cessation of suffering, a person has to desire absolutely nothing. And again, this is not for the person who's the average Buddhist coming in who wants to use this for their life. It's absurd. Okay, for the very, very advanced meditator who wants to get used to total and complete equanimity and imperturbable mind that can never be disturbed about anything, etc., and so forth, maybe you could talk to them about it. But the real general public to say this to them is something that would chase all, all people between the ages of 13 and about 30 away. You're not going to have much to do with it because they can't see how they can use it in life and it isn't being explained. So this is what we're up against when we talk about there is a dilution to Buddhist teaching that is happening today. And it's some of it is just really not anybody's fault because anybody who's teaching Buddhism is doing it for benevolent reasons, trying to help people. But when there's no guidance and they make it up for their own, uh, their, in their own ways, you know, their own personal ways, without understanding first what he meant himself when he said it. You see, that's where we really, really, really get in trouble, okay? Um, so that's all I would say about that. The truths, number two, the, the, these reasons here, these four reasons are what we're going to see popping up, and we're going to see the four noble truths coming up in here too. So the second reason was the truths, the Buddhist steps of for investigation in meditation. Now, as you practice your meditation, it's possible to repeat the steps of the Buddha's own investigation. And these four questions were asked by him in his meditation. They directed him to define suffering, to define the cause, to define the cessation, that, uh, and then develop a path to that cessation that he could use to teach others. This is what he was doing. In the beginning, he was doing it for his own answers. And as you probably know, when he became the Buddha, he thought, had to stop and really decide if he was gonna teach or not. He got encouraged, he took a look around with the divine eye and divine ear, and he found there were a lot of people who might understand it. So he decided to go forth and teach. 
Next question is, so how, how did the Buddha figure out the cause of suffering? He investigated through deductive reasoning first, and you go into your, your Samyutta Nikaya, and you go into the Nidana Vaga, which means the dependent origination book. Nidana is the dependent origination. The book is the Vaga inside the Samyutta Nikaya, okay? It's book number 12. You go to suit number 10 and um, 10, 10 it's called in the origination. It's on page 537 of your Samyutta Nikaya. And then he defines it this way. When you listen to how he's doing this, I'm only going to read a tiny bit of it and you'll get the idea. He relates this to the monks later, what he did before he was enlightened. And he starts out by saying bhikkhus before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, not yet fully enlightened, it occurs to me, alas, the world has fallen into trouble in that it is born, ages, and dies. It passes away and is reborn again. Yet it does not understand the escape from this suffering headed by aging and death. Now watch what he's doing because he's going to discover this not from the front but from the back the way we normally look at it. He's going to discover it by deductive reasoning called neti neti in the Brahmin tradition and and this deductive reasoning is going to work. Watch it start working. When now, when now will an escape be discerned from this suffering headed by aging and death? This is what he starts to wonder about. And then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does aging and death come to be? By what is aging and death conditioned? What has to be there in order for aging and death to happen? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took a place in me, that took place in me, a breakthrough by wisdom. So he starts to discover dependent origination. There's that word, wisdom. And what he's now going to uncover in this sutta is all of the 12 links. When there is birth, aging and death comes to be. Aging and death has birth as condition. And then it occurs to me, when what exists, does birth come to be? By what will earth, birth is birth conditioned? And then through careful, a careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom when there is where there it when there is existence. Now we call existence habitual tendencies. Habitual, it has a history. Bawa is the word. If you want to write down the history. Bawa is the word, and first they translated it as existence, and it became obvious that the people who translated it were linguists, and that's true. And they weren't necessarily um, practical meditators. And so this could have made sense in a linguistic sense, it makes sense, but it doesn't tell you anything. And then after that, uh, they changed the translation later after a few hundred years and they said, uh, it, we're gonna call it being. Being was one step better, but it still didn't signify what was happening here. And after the being was translated, then came the word becoming. Now becoming was better for the meditators because it had movement in it. Something that's becoming is happening, is moving. Okay, and what we needed was the energy for birth to happen. You see what I'm saying? And then what happened after that was Vimala Ramsey, uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey takes it, discusses it with a, the highest, the biggest Pali scholar in Burma, who was um, uh, Usilananda, who was his teacher and he had the highest awards of anybody with Pali in all of Burma. And he says, yeah, you could say that it is your habitual tendencies. And what do we mean by habitual tendencies? Well, the old version of this with psychology was these are your personal recordings. You get stuck with them and when something happens, you use a recording 
to react. But then we looked at it and said, well, that's true, you know, you do react, but we could say there are habitual tendencies for um, this reaction to happen. And he said, yes, that's what they are. So they, they used to call them recordings. Now my daughter, who's a psychologist, tells me they call them, I think it's so cute, they call them looping because it's the computer age. They changed it and now they'll say to you, ah, aha, they say to the senior programmer who has, uh, is going to the psychologist and they say to him, you are looping again in your relationship, <laughs> you see? And they're meaning that you're making, you have one small thing that happens that simply goes around in your head and replays and gets re-stimulated and triggered each time something familiar happens that is like the first thing, okay? Then it occurs to me when what exists um, does exist and does this uh, habitual tendency come to be with by what is habitual tendency conditioned. And then we find that what he's doing is he's going all the way back through all of the 12 links. And then what happens is you find that the habitual tendency is triggered by the clinging, the ongoing thinking, the mental proliferation and that the clinging was triggered by the craving, the I don't like it, I don't want it mind, or the I like it, I want it mind, okay? And that before that there was a feeling, before that there was contact, and you go all the way back down to ignorance. This is how he figured this out. So he was using uh, the Four Noble Truths. Now, how was he using the Four Noble Truths here? Well, he's looking at uh, a piece of the suffering, and then he's looking for the cause of the suffering, you see? And then for the next, he sees what that is, that cause, and he does it again. So he's using one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, all the way through the sutta, okay? That's what he's doing in that section. Now, if we go again, he defined it uh, at uh, 140, Section 10 in the Sachivibanga Sutta. So let's look at the Sachivibanga Sutta in the, um, yeah, in, in uh, Majima Nikaya. Let's go to that one. And the reason we go to this one is because I think it's miraculous. <laughs> People say to me, you know, it's really too bad. This Buddha didn't leave us much information. He just taught us how to do breathing meditation. And I go, wow, what happened? <laughs> And what happened was nobody told a person about the suttas or anything about what was in them, and the Buddha didn't leave anything else. So when we go to Satchivibhanga Sutta, it's on 1087 of your Majjhima Nikaya, and we go to um, section um, uh, 10. I'm in the right, but, 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 wait a minute. It's not 140. We made a mistake here. It's 141. I'm sorry. Exposition of Truths. It is in, yes, yeah, Sachivibhanga, but it's 141, section 10. So listen from section 10, what it sounds like. And what, friends, is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Death is suffering. The sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair that you experience are suffering not to obtain what one once is suffering. And in short, the five aggregates, when affected by clinging, are suffering. That's a good place to tell you about this. In the suttas, you're gonna find the five aggregates affected by clinging and suffering. Be sure you understand this means the five aggregates if affected by clinging or the five aggregates when affected by clinging, that you at least understand that's what this means. Because if they're not affected by clinging, they're not suffering. And so once you learn about clinging, which you will learn more and more as we go along, you'll understand you do not have to cling and get involved in the craving and the clinging very heavily. You can let go, relax, smile, come back, keep going. And when, friends, is birth, 
what friends is birth, the birth of beings into various orders of beings. They're coming to birth, precipitations in the womb generation, the manifestation of the uh, aggregates obtaining the basis for contact. This is called birth. Now you can take this phrase and you can change it to mean not about a human birth only. It can't, doesn't say human birth. It says the birth of beings, but what is the being? The being could be one event happening in your life is like a being which has not, it's not there. It begins to happen. It is there and then it fades away. The origination and the, the origination, disappearance, gratification, danger and escape from this one event that happens at a time in life. And so what we're teaching you is a, a higher understanding of this dependent origination because we're teaching you how to use it and use the Four Noble Truths in examining these things. So he's asking in each one of these paragraphs in this whole description, what is this? And then how is it happening? And how does it come to be? And he's using the steps of the four steps of the four noble truths in order to practice as he's doing this very thing. What is aging? The aging of the beings in the various orders of beings. And here it's describing the human being with this paragraph, but it can also be an event from the beginning of it, the taking place of it, the fading away of it, and the disappearance of it. And what, friends, is death, the passing away of beings out of various orders of beings, they're passing away, dissolution, disappearance, dying off, uh, completion of time, dissolution of the aggregates laying down of the body. Again, 11, 12, and 13 look like it's all about a human being. But does it always have to be that you understand what's said in one sutta that is to be the law through the entire teaching? Be very careful about this. And when you start to see some of the higher teaching show up inside, you won't understand what it is until you understand he taught the middle way in everything. What if that's true? Ponder that a while. What if this teaching of the middle way didn't just mean he didn't teach eternalism and the soul and he didn't teach annihilationism. You're born, that's it, it's done. He didn't teach those two. He's in the middle. What if we took the idea of teaching the middle way and we started to apply it to everything that we read about in happening in the 37 requisites of enlightenment? What then? And what then is high tide instead of low tide? You start to really get into the deeper stuff. And what friends is sorrow, the sorrow, the sorrowing, sorrowfulness, inner sorrow, inner sorriness of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. And this is called sorrow. And what is lamentation? It is the wail, the lament, the wailing and lamenting, bewailing and lamentation of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state and this is called the lamentation. And what, friends, is pain? It is bodily pain, bodily discomfort, com uncomfortable feeling of bodily contact. This is what pain is. This is interesting. And what is grief? He made space for both of them, defined two kinds of pain. Mental pain, mental discomfort, painful, just uncomfortable feeling born of mental conduct, and this is called grief. A memory pops up. It devastates you. It pulls you down. Do you understand how it works? Can you let go of it and put it where it belongs in the past? And not sit in it and get consumed by it and stimulate new emotions that suck your energy away? Can you do that? That's very important. And what is despair? It is the trouble and despair, the tribulation and desperation of one who has encountered a misfortune and is affected by painful states. This is called despair. 
And it goes further than that, but this is all I wanted to show you how he was doing this with the suttas. It was when he began teaching that there came to be created the simile of the doctor, and it's based on the Four Noble, uh, noble Truths. He was like the doctor. We don't know who started this. I don't know if it's attributed to any one monk but or lay person. I don't know. Um, if somebody knows, they should tell me who it was. It's really nice to know that. You stop here for a moment. Let's just close your eyes and pretend the doctor is examining you. And here's what happens. A patient goes to the doctor. Because he's sick and suffering, the doctor identifies the sickness by investigating visible symptoms, and he sees that the patient is suffering. There is suffering. Number two, the doctor examines the patient more closely to find the root cause of the suffering in order to make a diagnosis. And there is the cause of the suffering. This is the cause, the diag is the cause of the suffering. Number three, the doctor has previously studied anatomy and therefore he knows what a healthy person should look and feel like. And there is this, the identification of existing cessation of suffering is, happens in human beings. Finally, the doctor announces his prognosis. The prognosis is the treatment plan. After identifying the cause of the suffering, he advises the patient to follow a treatment plan to return to good health, and there is a path to the cessation of this, uh, the cessation of suffering. Now, how important is it to follow the instructions of the doctor? We have lots of students that come, lots, all over the globe at this point. And there's a whole group that show up, they try it, and they say, you know, this doesn't work. <laughs> and in a retreat, you find out really fast, we find out very quickly, with five questions, what's wrong? And we tell you how to get back on track. But if you're in Africa or you're at Cape Town, Africa, or you're over there somewhere on the opposite side of the globe from me, I can't see you, I can't hear you, I can't talk to you. I don't know if you're being honest with me in the interview, it's on you know, all this stuff and I have to just go by what you write me. And we have to catch this. Noted in the summary, the simile, um, also, in this case, let's look at this. The, um, the wounded man is struck by a poisoned arrow. And uh, this is in uh, 105 in the Sunakata Sutta. Instead of putting the whole sutta here, I just put this in here. Uh, he can only keep questioning in his mind. And who did this? Why did they do it? Was there a reason from my past? Am I gonna die? Am I gonna live? What's gonna happen? Should I seek revenge? He's obsessed with this and he couldn't stop thinking about the unessential things long enough to heal his wound. But if the patient takes good care of himself, if he takes his medicine, he eats his food, gets proper air, proper exercise, proper sleep, he will heal himself and he will become healthy again. It is the same for the successful meditation. You realize you have painful feeling and disturbing emotions in your life. You learn how these work in your meditation. You learn how they operate. The proper meditation allows you to witness how things work and then escape. You become curious and you begin to watch your sixth sense doors in your being, your body, and you, your sixth sense systems, your optical system, auditory system, olfactory system, your oral system, your physical system. And you begin to realize they all have contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual reactions, and you see the birth of the suffering and how the suffering, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair happens. This is the salyatana, the six sense doors to the fasa contact, vedana, feeling, tanha, craving, upadana, clinging, the bhava, the um, habitual tendencies, and the jati, the birth of them, reaction, and the dukkha that happens, the suffering, and the Ouija, and we go around and around and around and around and around, okay?
it's how it works. You'll find more about that when we have a lesson only on the dependent origination. The second noble truth, there is a cause of the suffering. The Buddha examined very closely the cause of the suffering that arises and to find the cause of the dis-ease that occurs in mind and body. This is what he was trying to do. He's always, when he's, he's meditating, he's not just doing it for himself, he's doing it to get the answer for humanity, for all of humanity. And so how does the Buddha use the second noble truth in his investigation? At first, he thought that arising imperfections were causing suffering to his mind and body. He watched how both unwholesome and wholesome arising states occurred in the very same way. He began noticing that he was shifting his attention to the imperfections and each time his attitude toward these, these distractions was getting more personal. And as he continued practice, he finds that as suffering, the dukkha is arising. You can decrease the degree of suffering if you practice more impersonally, the anatta. Apply right effort, samawayama, correctly. An immediate degree of relief will begin to occur. You can see he's discovering this. You know, he's discovering this. 2,600 years ago, he's discovering this. It gets so exciting. So when we practice TWIM, we are using both the components of serenity or samatha. And we hear from a lot of older teachers that will say to you, that's the purpose of that is to calm you down. And insight, the vipassana, is to watch new knowledge arise after the, the calming down occurs, the new insights arise. These, we are told in the text, were originally yoked together side by side, not on top of each other, remember that, <laughs> within the original meditation. The master taught so that we could experience direct knowledge with clear comprehension. Side by side, two, two um, horses or two uh, oxen pulling the cart together as a team. That's what was going on. And when the insight was activated, it was sort of like pop out for a second. Wow, that's a nata. And then back in again. And oh, wow, I just saw the birth of a consciousness. <gasps> you see, these are insights as you're going along. But they're not using one of these to prepare you to do another practice and do that. That's something that's thoroughly a modern invention. Note to verify that they were together, you can go over to 149 and you go to 149 section 10. And when you get to 149 section 10, there's a summary. Now there, I found it in a few other places too, not just here, but I couldn't find them today. I love that when that happens. Um, but He's giving you a summary, the view of a person such as this with right view, his intention is right intention, his right effort, mindfulness, right mindfulness, and he goes down the whole list of the 37 requisites of enlightenment, his concentration, his right concentration, meaning it's productive. But his bodily action, verbal action, his livelihood, have already been well purified, that sentence comes from the Visuddhimagga. And that's a sentence that it was put in later, and that sentence implies you don't have to worry when you're practicing um, about the, your bodily actions, verbal actions, and livelihood when you're practicing meditation. That's the impression that it left to put this sentence in. And this is the problem when the writers do this kind of thing. They don't think about what it's, they, they don't have any way of knowing what the impact's going to be culture to culture, the way people receive this. Thus, the Noble Eightfold Path develops, uh, and this Noble Eightfold Path, the four foundations of mindfulness are, are in fulfillment in him, and all this stuff is in fulfillment of him. Four right kinds of striving is the practice of right effort. Striving and right effort are the same thing in the text. 
You can spend all day trying to separate the two, but you can't do it. They have exactly the same paragraphs describing them and in the situations they're placed, it means the same thing. Spiritual powers and come to development and then the five faculties and the five powers and seven enlightenment factors also come to fulfillment in him by development. These two things, serenity and insight, occur in him yoked evenly together. There's your statement. So it's funny, he didn't really, maybe he didn't think, you never know what happened 2,600 years ago, but maybe he didn't think in the end or the people didn't think anybody would not figure that out. But somehow it got lost when somebody came along as a super teacher and started teaching and then it wasn't there and then it got it went away from it and it's simple with the huge timeline that you're dealing with it's easy to see that happening he watched things as deeply as he could for longer and longer periods of time and to see if they were different ways that they arose and disappeared or if they all arose and passed away in the same way he began to understand that all suffering impersonally arises and passes away in the same way. Increasing tension as it's arising, arrives, as it arrives and feeling uh, it fade away as it passes away. So the tension symptom is very important. And the folks who have spent time with the Vipassana structure with the, the importance of feeling, sensing everything. This is a key thing. When they come to us, they, they learn this very quickly because they can, once we point it out, they can watch easily for the arising of the tension and the passing away of the tension. They can see it faster than other students. He then moved on to the third noble truth to determine if there was a way to reach cessation of this painful condition. In the third noble truth, there is a cessation of suffering. The Buddha realized all people experience temporary cessations of suffering during life. He wondered if this could happen for longer periods in time or whether it was always impermanent, arising, passing, arising, passing, the cessation state of happiness and that sort of thing. He realized a state of cessation of suffering feels like the absence of all tension and tightness involved with the arising of the suffering. And at first he assumed that he would have to force the suffering to stop in order to build up a state of no suffering. But this was not the case. And later on, he discovers an approach of withdrawing his attention off the suffering distraction and by quietly continuing his observation mindfulness, it is that idea that he finally confirms is correct and which leads him to an experience uh, of the liberation of mind or Nibbana. And you can review for yourself the moment that this discovery occurs by him in Majima Nikaya number 36. This is where it's going on. And if we, whoops, we don't need the Samyutta Nikaya, we need the Majima Nikaya here. It's like a juggling act tonight. 36. And you go to section 31 and 32, and what you find there is he is meditating and he has a memory strikes him comes up this memory comes into his mind before he goes back to meditate the rest of the night he says i recall that when my father the sakyan was occupied and he means in the harvest festival and the rose apple. He was under the rose apple tree and then and he calls his recollection of the rose apple tree that he remembers while his father was occupied in the harvest festival, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, I was quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana 
which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of the seclusion. So he was very content. And if you want to understand what happened to him, I always suggest that people find a forest that's pine trees in it. Pine works really well. You get a big pine tree at least 12 or 14 inches in circumference. You sit at the base of the pine tree, you let everything go and just relax. And you just start, you just start slow, relaxed breathing if you want to, and you'll fall deeper, deeper in under the tree. Could that be the path to enlightenment? He wonders. And then following on that memory came the realization that indeed is the path to enlightenment. And then he says, I thought, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? I thought, I am not afraid of that pleasure, that calmness, that quietness, that equanimity, that sitting in the different levels. I'm not, I'm not afraid of that kind of pleasure since it has nothing to do with the external worldly sensual pleasures and unwholesome states is what this sentence means. And then he goes on from there to talk a little bit more. He changes his practice and we believe what happened is that that's the point where he is then able to go through to Nibbana when he shifts to this impersonal, uninvolved, not trying to make anything happen, like sitting, things change. This change was so successful that later on he realizes that surely it can be beneficial for any common man or woman to learn how to reduce their levels of suffering in daily life as a routine part of life. And this is true, even though they may not fully commit themselves to reaching the liberation of mind, Nibbana. Because this being true, thousands began to come and listen to the Buddhist teachings. And it is our position at DSMC that those early lay disciples of the Buddha at that time began to teach a simple daily practice in life, which came from some small changes in the definitions of the last three folds of the Noble Eightfold Path. Because these three folds that are in the end of the, the bottom part of the Eightfold Path are obviously structured to support your meditation practice and the practice is supporting your uh, entire life, your the practice and the, the path and the practice combined. These three folds are a harmonious effort. That's the right effort, change to harmonious effort. Purification and retraining of mind is what happens when you practice this right effort. Harmonious mindfulness is the specific kind of observation skill that he was teaching. So you have to have a meditation that allows you to develop clear observation to comprehend how all of this comes together and works in your meditation because the meditation is your observation instrument this mindfulness is the observation instrument and the meditation itself is like a vehicle the harmonious concentration is the third one and we say harmonious because it's a lighter form. It's productive without tension. Why would I say it's productive? Because you go right through one, two, three, four jhanas. You're able to do that when you're practicing Brahma Viharas. We watch you go through one, two, three, four, and then have it fall and change over into the Karuna in infinite space, the Mudita in infinite consciousness, and then experience the equanimity start growing in nothingness more powerful and stable. But in the fourth jhana, when you get a four-footed, strong kind of equanimity, you're ready to fall into the natural um, metamorphism from metta into karuna. Once the meaning of these folds are refined in your mind and applied correctly, a whole new world of investigation opens up for you. It becomes obvious that these three folds had to be clear to operate correctly. You had to understand them clearly and be able to do them correctly. 
Within the twim teaching, we say harmonious instead of right because the name of each fold in the eightfold path uh, needs to be bringing harmony to life. And the purpose of your practice is bringing harmony into the whole world. To build enough people practicing this way where the energy is overflowing like the earth energy is overflowing back there. See the little rim energy. But don't listen to those people down there are really crazy. <laughs> That's why I'm up here today. It's really quiet. <laughs> um, the tranquil wisdom insight meditation practice that we are teaching you, we believe is quite possibly the core practice that was taught by the Buddha in early times, along with several other supporting practices, filling in various needs for various people. Breathing meditation extended for some people to calm them down. Forgiveness meditation to cleanse the person's mind before they can smoothly pursue the metta meditation. Auditory practices, meaning sitting down and you find out if you're very musical, that to take the ohm, the sound of the earth, and simply let it reverberate through you. Om. If you can do this, in your mind, in your mouth, and the top of your head is just tingling like crazy. You're doing it correctly, and you can feel it start to vibrate now. Through, and then you just do it for about three minutes or a minute or two if you want before you start meditating, and it pulls you from the office, the train, and the bus <laughs> right into meditation. It's a wonderful thing when you're in the city, and chanting. Let's chanting. We mentioned chanting last time. Just. The brief statement here, chanting in Buddhism was for the purpose of preservation. It was always about preservation. Even the services developed and created and carried through the, the timeline all have to do with preservation points. In the Thai system, they always are talking about the dependent origination and how, first how uh, the suffering arises and occurs and then how it stops with the dim diminishing elimination of each one of these, then the next one can't come up until it's gone. They talk about that. So it's all part of the teaching, every bit of it. There wasn't anything that was for the beauty of the artistic department or for the Academy of Music in choral singing in Sister is gone? Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> I suspect Venerable Damagatis is taking care of it. It's weird, I think. We cannot hear you, Sister Ken. Sister, unmute yourself. Okay. All right. I, okay. okay. I do it again. Okay. Whoops, I lost my document. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> Just a second. I'll be right back. <laughs> um, Mm. Mm. Oh, crumb. Wait. Just a second. I disconnected something. Yeah. Um.
There we go. Just a second. Oh, uh -huh. here we go, right? Okay, um, now I have to find you again. Okay. Uh -huh. How do I get you to big get bigger? How do I do it, Ardika? <sighs> I don't know. I've never tried it. Uh, ha have you shared the screen? Wait a second. I I have I lost I lost the document again. And, okay, just I had it all. <laughs> so, Relax, smile, come back. <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> okay, let's see. I have to go down. Where do I have to go? I have to go back here. Okay, Sorry. there it is. Do you see that or not? You don't see that, do you? Not yet. All right, just a minute. Um, there, now I have you here. Now I take you here, then I go there. Now I'm back, okay. Uh, okay, okay. You, can, you can hear me okay? Okay. Yes. So the gentle wisdom inside meditation practice that we're teaching you, we believe is quite possibly the core practice that was taught by the Buddha in early times. Uh, along with several of the other supporting practices, we already did this part and we come down here there's no question that the correct meaning for right effort leads a person to relief, immediate relief from suffering in daily life today. The six tiny steps in the twin practice fulfill the four steps that are mentioned within the text describing right effort. And we'll do another lesson maybe later that's right effort in another way we'll discuss it. Four noble truths. There's a path to the cessation of suffering. And if you do this practice cycle enough times in exactly the same way, you'll see my folders. <laughs> this is great, okay. Um, if you, let's see, da, 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 uh, in the same way, you will always be retraining your brain to make change. You will always find yourself unconsciously completing the entire Eightfold Path as you continue to build the strength of your practice. Eventually, mind discovers how much more comfortable and profitable this practice is for our life. It can suddenly make a decision on its own to perform all the steps automatically whenever it's sen it senses the symptoms of craving begin to arise. This does begin to happen. We only call twin practice the six R's because in English all of the steps begin with R. Whenever you perform right effort correctly, you are witnessing all four noble truths by witnessing suffering, releasing craving and clinging, which is the cause, experiencing a cessation of craving, suffering, and number four, as you continue to replace suffering with a smile, you continue to bring up more wholesome mind states and you keep them going. Staying on your meditation object longer is the most wholesome thing of all. Essentially, you are also fulfilling the entire Eightfold Path, replacing suffering with a smile. The twin six steps, here's twin. Number one, you recognize whenever the tension is arising during your meditation practice, or if you're doing a task in life and you have a distraction, you notice it. You release the attention off any distraction that has caught your attention. Number three, you relax your mind, the head of any leftover tension. Relax your face muscles, just relax, you smile, your face muscles just relax away. 
You re-smile as you return to your object of meditation and continue on using uplifted observation without tension. And you repeat the cycle only when you feel tension and tightness pulling mind's attention away. And this is the sum total of right effort, sensing an unwholesome mind state, releasing the unwholesome mind state, bringing up a wholesome mind state, a smile, continuing to bring up more wholesome mind states to support meditation. Repeat the cycle whenever it's needed. This is how you experience cessation of suffering. As you continue purifying and retraining mind in each cycle, in each practice. The fourth noble truth, there is a path to the cessation of suffering. There's a few ways to present the Eightfold Path. Most of us know about the one that is a guide for life. This is important and we will, it, we will be covered in other lessons this part. But there is also a path that directly supports meditation to succeed. And there is a version where even one smile can fulfill your responsibility to work on the entire Eightfold Path each day. I only want to present here how important your smile is. And if you believe you don't have any time to work on the fulfillment of your Eightfold Path, you need to reconsider because can, you can complete the path each day and imprint it onto your mind by just doing one thing, smile, and then give that smile away to someone who needs it. There is a separate page for the Noble Eightfold Path that's set up in a diagram. And I think, I bet you I can get to it, maybe. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Time is set. Uh, okay, we're doing all right. Uh, I can never remember how to do this, how I get out of here. Okay, there we go. I went there. Now I go here again. And I go into the Eightfold Path for just a minute. This is a, um, a table that shows you, we usually give it to you in retreat, and I want you all to be able to zip through it with me now. Um, the Eightfold Path in One Smile. Once that we have a clear understanding of the interwoven nature of the Noble Eightfold Path, we can then fulfill the entire path in one smile. And this is a wonderful experience. You can do it anytime in lockdown, anywhere, for anyone, for any reason. Right view, the Samaditi, is practiced as harmonious perspective. You choose to live through a more impersonal perspective. In a, it, it's a major key to living a happy life. So the idea is to lighten up and don't take things so personally. Just let go more often and smile as you let go and relax. The right thought, Sama Samkapa, is practiced as harmonious imaging. This means bringing up the image of smiling and laughing, which lightens mind and sharpens awareness in a brief moment for clearer mindfulness. Not taking things personally, supporting hope, wholesome thoughts. Right speech, samavacha, is practiced as harmonious communication. You communicate not only speech, that's why this one was changed a little bit, smiling lightly, laughing, and keeping your practice light for success. This is a communication with yourself that is so important especially communications with mind, speech, and body. Your body motions, the sound of your voice, the thoughts in your mind. Right action is Sama Kamanta. Harmonious movement. It has to do on the higher level with mindful observation. But remember, 
Remembering to notice the impersonal movements of mind's attention. And then applying right effort, the six R's, to direct mind away from the unwholesome mind states into wholesome mind states. Keeping your smiling and a light mind going as much as possible. Keeping your inner smile alive and well. What you're doing is, instead of just watching out for your movement, is you're also going one step higher, watching the movement of mind's attention and helping it to learn to stay in place in the present moment. Right livelihood is Sama Awija, is practiced as harmonious lifestyle. And this has to do with developing a new habit of smiling and gently laughing during your daily life. You're laughing at yourself. Life can be in any place, anywhere, especially a lockdown. It can be hell or it can be heaven. It's up to you. So you make the decision how it's going to be. It's about letting things go more easily and developing patience and compassion for others. Also, it's about setting up a lifestyle to support this practice. What do I mean? Even if it's a tiny house, do you have one corner or one tree in the yard or one space just in the yard if there's no tree where you can set up a chair or something where when you're sitting there, nobody bothers you and you take your turn at your time, your personal time. That's what that's about. Right effort, Samawayama, we've already discussed harmonious practice, the four steps of right effort. You're seeing the mind caught by an unwholesome thought or feeling. You're letting it go of that unwholesome thought or feeling and relaxing, smiling and laughing to be caught and redirecting this higher mind back to the wholesome object, which you would say is the metta or the karuna, wherever you are in your practice, by smiling and laughing lightly. We're not talking about laughter, which is the enemy of um, metta. You, until you, and you can't stop. That's not, that's the enemy. But you don't give up smiling as a human being, especially in a group. My internet is unstable, they just told me, but we'll keep going. Right mindfulness is a harmonious observation. So instead of saying right mindfulness is a pointed concentration on something, this is really different. The Buddha found out that wasn't working. And noticing the nature of mind's attention when it's light and smiling versus when we have tension arising and the mind gets heavy and serious and pulled down. That's with the one pointedness. And noticing when you are caught by this feeling and tendency and remembering what to do, running your steps of six R's. And then a harmonious collectedness instead of right concentration. This is Sama, Samadhi is a, and I would even start saying Sama Ekagata. How's that? Instead of Samata, uh, instead of Sama Samadhi, I would might start saying Sama Ekagata because Ekagata was the name of concentration in the time of the Buddha. Samadhi was a word, according to Rice Davies, didn't come up and happen until after he was enlightened. And so we hear about the Ekagata before that time, but we don't hear Ekagata so much after a certain time after the Buddha's gone. We hear Samadhi when he's teaching, but he's not, he's talking about a different defined, uh, refined level of concentration. A precise level of light concentration collected a unified mind that keeps the practice running smoothly, a mind that is alert and calm, composed, able to stay with the moment or task in life without distractions or heaviness arising to pull it 
away. We have to go back to the other, um, the other, yeah, I do have to go back to the other document, which I probably drew out again. So um, just let me do this real quick, if I can do it real quick. <laughs> this is so much fun. I can never, I can't, I need to do this every day, Ardika, for a week, and maybe I'll learn <laughs> and keep it in my head. <laughs> it's very hard for me to do that. No, I'm not going to leave. I'm just going to minimize this. There you go. And pull up the document one more time. Oops, that's not it. I don't need that. Nope. We need this. Okay, now I have to go back to you guys. When we get back to you, there, and I come here, and I go here, and I pull you down again to the, where we're going to the, okay. Okay, now we try to continue with the, um, The com this completes the use of the fourth the noble truth. And continuing in the ways the Buddha used the four noble truths, we're really not that far from the end of this. Uh, let's take a look at one sutta to see how he uses the four noble truths to frame up his teaching. Now, this is something I use when I'm teaching in a, uh, you know, a sutta class where you all have your books around me. But so I know you don't all have the books. So I did this a special way. So let's use a sutta for an example in our investigation. We're going to use the Madhupandika Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, Majjhima Nikai number 18. And we're only going to look at two sort of paragraphs, number seven, section seven and section eight. So the first one, the question is asked by the monks. Venerable Sir, how does the Blessed One assert and proclaim his teaching in such a way that he does not quarrel with anyone in the world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas in this generation with its recluses and its brahmins, its princes, and its people? And Venerable Sir, how is it that perceptions no longer will underlie the Blessed One, that Brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being? So the monks ask, how can they reach the cessation of suffering that is occurring here in the case of the Buddha? And the next verse, Bhikkhu, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man. Okay, this was talking about the already identified cause of the suffering. Number two, truth. There is suffering. And when you are personally identifying, perceiving, and imagining other more concepts, these notions from uh, mental proliferation, which is thinking, 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 paying attention to all of this is a distraction uh, here below. And this is suffering. However, if you give up concern with all these distractions for by applying the right effort, twim, then you will find relief. And the Buddha says, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome or hold onto, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying wrong views, and of the underlying tendency to doubt of the underlying tendency to conceit of the underlying tendency to desire for being 
And for this, and we say desire for reacting in your life, it's gone. Of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons and quarrels and brawls and disputes, and recrimination, malicious words and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. This is talking about three and four. Number four, truth, the path describing the outcome of you having practiced twim completely, completing the three folds of the eightfold path, six, seven, and eight, that we mentioned, completing very clearly right effort, right mindfulness, and the right productive concentration and having it all work. That's what's happening. And then he says, that is what the Blessed One said, having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat. He went into his dwelling. And then, I don't know, I think it was Kasapa came out and he told how it worked. Kasapa early to explain it more deeply. But I just wanted to show you, you can find the different, um, find the uh, different um, truths inside the Sutta framework the cause of suffering, but the suffering itself, he describes it well, and he shows you what is causing it is the mental proliferation and all these pieces inside of it. He's giving you everything. He doesn't leave anything out. I mean, it was remarkable what he did. That's the end of that example. The truth routine, uh, routinely appear in suttas to describe situations of suffering, bringing up the cause presenting the solution and talking about a path by which you can reach the cessation of your suffering. In the Buddha's encounters and interviews, he addresses someone, he listens to their suffering, what challenges them, and then he presents a solution for that suffering and he is teaching his own discovery of the truths. One, two, plus three, plus four. He often questions a person and continues with them um, until they work it out in their own mind. They keep staying with him a long time. Some of the suttas are long. And he questions them and he likes to present them with similes appropriate with their societies for easier understanding. Similes make sense within their own society but can change in other societies and other time periods. The way you hear me teach you about remembering uh, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, birth of reaction, and the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And I take a car and I tell you, when you put the key in the ignition, that's contact. When you start the engine, that's, that, is, uh, that is feeling. And then when you go in first gear, when the car jerks forward, that's craving. I don't like this. And then when you start the second gear, you go a little faster, that's clinging. And your mind is running, running with why you don't like this, whatever it is. And then you go in third gear and you start to go faster. And that one is when you're running through your mind, what am I going to take as my reaction to this? What am I going to use? And then in fourth gear, you're zooming down onto the highway and you're speeding along just fine. In fourth gear, smoothly driving along. And that one is when you have the birth of the action, the reaction, when you're driving faster and you're getting irritated with the whole situation that you're driving to meet the situation. And then all of a sudden, we have something happen. You stall the car, it stops running, you're on the side of the road. You have just gone through the aging and the death of this event. And now, because you look at your, your mobile phone, you find out this morning, you forgot to turn the power on last night and your phone is empty and you don't have any way of getting help on the side of the road. So you have what happens to you then? You have sorrow and lamentation and pain and grief and despair until you can catch a ride back 
to get some gas. There you go. That's a simile, but it's from this time. He gives you similes about goats and about cows and about oil lamps and about all kinds of stuff in the anthill. If you want a real simile, go and read the anthill. Uh, that's amazing, that one sutta about the anthill. So this is how he arranges the suttas to teach the Dhamma. And the fourth, the noble truths are his communication. He uses it. That was the way he did it when he was teaching. And then the next part is the noble truths are his communication and reconciliation plan to bring about better peaceful civil cooperation for family, communities, and relationships. This is where he starts using these, these four noble truths to make peace with the kings between them or to settle disputes, have, help them to settle disputes or actually to stop wars between two warring factions or two armies that are about to attack each other. Improving communication instead of crashing the relationship, the first thing I want you to talk about. You can practice living by these four noble truths in today's life systematically and check in with whatever is going on in your daily life that needs a solution. You can 6R it and move on in the ever moving present time. But also if there is bad communication between people going on or no communication, there is something that you can try. During the week, you can take turns, by agreement, take turns, sharing four points in short, shared time on the phone during a break at work, and then maybe longer time on the weekends if there is more free time. So this is a form of communication that I teach couples that just aren't getting along. And when I listen to both of them, what I usually find out is there's not really listening going on by both people and there's not real communication going on in the relationship. And without it, this is not going to be a happy ending. So you agree on your time at work when you have a break uh, and you agree at the start of connecting on the phone. You agree uh, on your time allowed each way. So you have 20 minutes. You're going to take maybe uh, eight minutes each person and then two minutes at the end, a second round to say goodbye. And you agree on keeping time on a watch. One of you is going to keep time or both of you are going to keep time on the watch. When the one person is speaking, you're keeping time. When you're speaking, the other person is keeping time. So suppose you have the 20 minutes and there's a problem that you really want to solve in the relationship. You know there's something wrong. So each person takes the eight minutes and the other person will just listen. And uh, they will tell you, you, you ask them the questions and they will tell you what's going on well right now. What's going good right now? That's the first question. And you let them tell you something. And then you say, what's tough? Tell me what's tough right now. That's the second question. Third question is, what is your next step uh, in this towards a solution, whatever is going on? Boss is having a problem with you, somebody's making trouble, something got mixed up at work, whatever it is, okay? And then what kind of support can I give you so that you can solve this? And you as a partner can do something for them, so maybe the biggest thing you can do is let them bounce their solutions and their ideas off of you without telling them it's right or wrong or suggesting stuff, the other person turns now, repeats the questions for that person and they do it again. So keep it moving, you keep it moving, that's all. You just listen and after each one takes eight minutes, then you take two minutes each before you say goodbye. You just talk about something good coming up in the day uh, at the end and then you hang up until the person comes home. Your job is not to solve the person's problem or to advise them. This is new. It is to encourage them to become independent and feel supported. If you have an idea to help them, you can ask them first if you can talk to them about it when talk about what they talked about later on. 
get permission first. Don't go charging home and say, you know what you talked about. They might not want to do it when they first get home, but you can ask them after supper, you know what you were talking about this morning? Um, I, I had some idea. Do you want to talk about it? But leave it up to them. But you always take turns. And taking turns in relationships seems to be a new kind of idea sometimes. <laughs> On weekends, try doing this for a half hour each way. Take a walk together or just sit under a tree together. And then really, it can really completely change the relationship for each person to be listened to. Just listen to. It's the first time for many older relationships, and maybe this has never occurred. It's very healthy, and it helps everybody around the relationship. The second part of communication is the way he used it was reconciliation for more critical situations. And I think the most uh, successful thing I did with this was there was a very large Christian family in Missouri who approached me and said, we have a huge problem. We just wondered if you have any suggestions. And I suggested this to them. And it, it involved 12 people in the family, which was a heavy duty thing in one house. And each person involved has to have equal input and be respectfully listened to when you try this. You take one piece of paper like this, okay? You take one piece of, um, of paper like this and you fold it in half like this so you have four pieces four sides of paper and the first side you're going to write on the first side i lost my place the first place side one you write down on this front what do you personally see as the biggest challenge that has come up side two Everybody has a piece of paper at the table. All 12 people had paper at the table except for the two-year-old and the three-year-old. You write down what you think is the biggest challenge happening in that house so it doesn't work. Second page, like this, you fold it like that. Now you have this page and this page. Write down what you see as the cause for the challenge because how did it happen? What, what was the cause of it happening, okay? And then you turn the page, and on the third page you say, just, just pretend that now you are completely in charge. Not mom and dad, not your big brother, nothing. Not your big sister, but you're in charge of the house. And you should tell us how to solve this. And write down what you think the solution should be. And incidentally, it was a nine or 10 year old that came up with most of the solution in the house. It was very funny. And then the last part, you go like this, you open it up and you take the paper, you write down uh, what kind of support you need from the other people if you try that solution. That's the four parts of the paper. You turn the paper in to the head of the family. The mom and the dad or the dad or the mom, whoever's there, the, they get to be the head, whoever's the head of the house, they get to sit down in private and take a look at everybody, what they've written down. You turn in your papers and their job is to come up with a solution to try in the house, which must reflect something suggested by each one of the people woven into what they're gonna try. You got that? So everybody at the table, the, you come together again, and when you present that solution that will be tried so that each person hears their own input reflected in it somehow when you write it. So it's a little bit of work for the people who are the head of the house. You can't just do this, just flip it off. You have to pay attention. And then when you present how to complete the solution at the end, how we're gonna try this together. While keeping these precepts, in their case, they had to keep the commandments. In our case, we keep the precepts. And the entire Eightfold Path is a guide system, which is their commandments. The Eightfold Path is inside the Ten Commandments. You check in with each uh, week for a time with me or somebody guiding, some outside guide, just to see how the solution's working. And you, if you have to repeat it, you repeat this again after a, a couple months of trying it. 
And this is for any size group or family where there is an issue. Anybody. In the case of this house, two of the couples decided to move out and live on their own. Uh, one couple and a couple with one of the kids. The other children that were staying in the family cleaned up the entire house, repainted it, cleaned up the yard, cleaned up the cars, cleaned up everything so mom could go back to work. And everything came together. They didn't lose the property. And as a family, everybody was being supportive and they all showed up together for holidays. I would say that was a new kind of communication where everybody started to hear what was essentially going on. So the last question here concerning the effect of the introduction of the Four Noble Truths into the world in the time of the Buddha. The question comes up by a lot of people, how did Buddhism affect the world in the time of the Buddha? The outcome of the Buddhist practice shifted the attitudes of entire societies. In the strongest areas, eventually it affected economic systems. Geographically, it shifted the demographics of wealth, changed justice systems, augmented marketplaces and, and tactics, shifted the strategies and the outcomes of armies at war. As the teaching spread over vast kingdoms, it even changed some forms of governments and it brought forth early human rights for women and members of the lower level castes in certain societies. Eventually, Buddhism resulted in a more evenly grounded people who, because of their understanding of this new knowledge, they discovered what a lack of fear could be like, and their shift in perspective helped them through nearly anything that happened, structurally, economically, ecologically, or governmentally. In spite of tyrannies, dictatorships, disasters, and wars, in that part of the world, people somehow found and continued to find strength to lift up each other and share during some very incredible times. So this is the end of this, and Q says, of course, what's next? <laughs> and the next installment is going to get started to get into the more into the heart, uh, into uh, the meditation explanation, the true nature of how things are working. And it's going to be about meditation and mindfulness and how they work together. And there's going to be more time for us to share uh, because these are going to be a little bit shorter. So I really want you to think of questions and come to class with questions next time from this or any of the others. And let me click back over to you guys. if I can figure out how to do that. There we go. It doesn't let me do it. Here, I can do it this way. Cool, I can slip you all around. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> I don't see how I can do that one. Let me see this one. Let me see. Okay. Hello, everybody. So, anybody have any questions on this? You get the idea. Mm hmm? <laughs> Anybody? No questions? Let's see what time is it? Okay. How is everybody doing with practice? And do you have any questions about practices right now? Hmm? That was a really bright one. Okay. <laughs> do you get the feeling? You kind of see what's happening with um, calming down with breathing and then going into practicing with uh, using the Brahma Viharas. And the question we always have when we look at it, uh, you, see the four, you start watching the Four Noble Truths like happening all around you. You can see it happening. You know, if you're in a hospital, you see it happening all the time. If you're in a school, you see it happening all the time. And um, the thing that people ask me sometimes is why is this, is twin working uh, faster for people and the reason that it's happening is simple because it's a practice you take into life with you and so when something's happening to you you stop yourself right away 
it's a check and balance system. You know, you know, there is a, uh, a wonderful solution for a stutterer. If somebody has is stuttering and they need, um, there's a system. Uh, my husband used to teach the kids at school if they had a problem with, uh, as a speech and language pathologist, he used to teach the kids at school and it's called a check it system, check it. And if the person starts to stutter and they have been given the solution to stop, relax, pull together and start again. Well, your job as a buddy is to hang out with the person and say, hey, check it, check it and get them to do it all the time. And what he, was, what he was doing was taking the connection between the brain and the speech, and he was stopping the break, the broken piece that was slipping off track and giving it a pause so he could come back and then the person could speak a little slower and consistently. Yeah, like you'd like me to speak. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and uh, we, in America, what's really wrong with Sister Kama is she was born on the East Coast, not the West Coast. And the East Coast talks very fast, you know, and just it's very fast. It, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, uh, Baltimore, and then as you go south from, let's see, Boston, New York, Philadelphia and then Baltimore it starts to slow down a little bit and people are here I'm so glad you are at our city Why wow, we are so delighted would you like to have tea with us at our house you see they start talking like that when you're in the deep south all of a sudden they're saying why my saints you have come to visit and we are so pleased that you have gotten here to Georgia. It's a delight. Please come and have some silk jumplings. We just love to have you sit on our porch. You see, like that's what's happening. Then you go into the West and everything is perfectly clear. Like this is an untouched section of the language and the person who is getting paid $5,000 for speaking a half a minute and saying 3,000 words is able to speak this clearly and very fast. But he, he, he's <laughs> only from the Midwest would you find somebody who could do that. It's very interesting. And then out West, everything changes again. And if you go into the mountains, it gets very comical. I was once working, um, working for a um, McDonald's. <laughs> I moved from the north down into Virginia and I was working at a McDonald's. The only reason I was working in the McDonald's when I first got there, well, I was looking for a better job. And um, it was because the McDonald's was in the parking lot next to the apartments where we were living. So the kids would go to school my husband would go to work and I would go to the McDonald's early in the morning and open it up and I could stay late at night because it was right on my doorstep and I could close it anyway I was in there once and we have a thing in McDonald's that is called um, the McDonald's dance <laughs> and it has a long a long uh, counter and the, you know we're standing behind the counter and then behind Behind the counter is the cook up here he's up here and then to the left of us is the french fries and to the right of us is the uh, sodas and the uh, chocolate floats and stuff like that you have to mix put them on the mixer you know mix them up but most of the time at lunchtime when everybody comes there is a freezer and the drinks are in the freezer all lined up for the, the chocolate milkshake or the vanilla milkshake is there. Well, one day, um, it was like a Friday and uh, they let everybody go home at about three o'clock and figured that the kids from 
the uh, football games, they weren't going to come because the buses had not come by yet. So they weren't going to come. And as soon as they let these people go home, I was the only one left with the boss, the manager and the cook. He was back there. And all of a sudden, two buses turned in and parked on either side. Each bus had 60 people in it. <laughs> I understand this is not lunchtime, okay? And then they had to order all these hamburgers and Big Macs and fish sandwiches, and they had to order French fries, and then they wanted to have their, their shakes, and the shakes were not in the freezer box because this was not made up ahead of time. And so I, I was um, dressed in white, and brown and you might notice that mcdonald's in different regions of the world or different countries white and green white and red white and this is white and chocolate brown the color of my outfit and the, the men came in you know from the bus these kids were all from the mountains both teams for two different sports are from the mountains and they came in there and they said to me, I want to have two and you know, up and two frightened and four chips and four chips and four chips. What? And I said, what? I want to have two hamburgers, two fish fries, fish sandwiches, four french fries and two shakes. That's what that said. And it just like was rolling over. I said, excuse me? <laughs> I couldn't get it at all. And then I got used to it and it was amazing what happened, you know? And then I went, I never had to make the shakes. Never had to, but this time I did. So I got the shake and the shake is, you know, the shake, you put it in the container and you put the container on the thing that spins and it spins for a certain amount of time, but you're supposed to turn it off before the shake gets up to the top. And I put four of these on a machine and they started to spin and they got to the top and they kept spinning and they were throwing out chocolate sauce like this. And I screamed at the manager and he says, don't scream. And I said, come out here. And it's going, bloom, 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 bloom. And he was in white and brown, and I was in white and brown, and pretty soon, white with chocolate spots and brown all over us. <laughs> and he, when he walked out, he slipped on the floor, and he was sitting on the floor, and I started laughing, and then he started laughing, and then the whole place started laughing, and then we It was the most fantastic thing I ever saw. The solution to the situation. With this big guy, you know, he was really mad. I need my froggy shy. I said, what? I need my sandwiches and fries. I need my shy fry. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. And I got it. But I don't know how I got it. I just had a lot of fun with it because I grew up understanding one thing. In any situation, just remember, smile. <laughs> smile you know just turn around and send men out of you with your heart soul and you just they're not going to come get you if they do be sure to give them ice cream <laughs> and everything will be fine and if you are putting this out in your mind you're manifesting this bubble around you you're manifesting it these girls told me last week we come to your class just to see you smile <laughs> And just bump, they feel this. I, mean, I didn't know it was going out over the airwaves. I didn't know. It needs a smile. There is a Hindu group. Um, I think it's Hindu. It's Kashmir Shaivism. And it was uh, used to be Muktananda. And it, then it became um, Chitvalasananda in India. She's in a place. I uh, can't remember the name of the place, but it's out in the hills outside of Mumbai. And um, the lessons they teach there, they send all over the world. And the first lesson they sent to me, it's two weeks long, each lesson package. And the lesson for you to dwell upon for one week or two weeks long, you dwell upon this one thought, 
You only have two choices in the world, in your life, two choices. And she's, it just says, you can either laugh about it or cry about it. That's it. You can smile and accept it as the present time and let it go over you, understanding it's not going to stay, it can go beyond. And even I was listening to what they were writing on the group today and I was thinking, you know, it's amazing that you can get to a place where when someone passes away, you understand they were born, they were here and they passed. That's this celebration that's going on today. And I happy, I can't remember what, <laughs> happy this day, this celebration, I forget the name of it. It was on the twin group, somebody explained it and tried. Uh, major, what was it? Do you know what it was, Major? That holiday? I don't know if he knows. The point is accepting the flow of life and all of teaching spiritually based that brings us down and grounds us is returning to something back there on the earth. It's taking you back to ground you in nature, to figure out, look at this reality, to what the Buddha figured out. What did he discover? The suffering exists and comes and goes and flows and happens, arises, is there and passes away. He talks about the origin, the, what you have to understand. He points out the origin, the disappearance, the gratification where you hook into it and take it personally, mm -hmm. the danger of that and the escape. In the Chachaka Sutta, that's toying with the Four Noble Truths. Look at the suffering, look at the lust, the hatred and uh, aversion. Look at the grief, look at the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief and despair. Even if it comes, it's not going to stay. It's coming, arising, existing, and passing away. That's what you have to get with. Get with the river, get with the river. You watch a canoe, if you ever went in a canoe, and I used to do a lot of canoeing, you can just stop canoeing, stop paddling and just steer on the rivers. That's all you're doing. You're just going with the flow, going toward the rapids, positioning it so you don't turn over, <laughs> hopefully. As you're going down and you're going through the rapids, you're just going down and turning it over. But you're, you're getting with the flow. You want to understand life, you go to a side of a river, you pick up a stick, you throw it in and you watch it. And where does the rain come? And where does the rain go? Huh? Where is that? That's the best description I should give you before we close the class. It's the story of the rain on top of the mountain. Five fifty three, page five fifty three in the Samyutta Nikaya. There you go. Five fifty three. It's worth memorizing, it's really beautiful. The last part of this sutta. Just as when the rain pours down in thick droplets on a cleft on the mountaintop. I'm sorry, do it again. Just as when the rain pours down in thick droplets on the mountaintop, the water flows down along the slope and it fills the cleft, the gullies and the creeks. And these fill up the pools and these fill up the lakes. 
and these fill up the streams, and these fill up the rivers, and these fill up the great ocean. So too, with ignorance as condition, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixth sense basis come to be. With the sixth sense basis as condition, contact comes to be. And with contact as condition, a feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendencies wake up, come to be. With habitual tendencies as condition, birth of reaction comes to be. With birth of reaction, the aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be in each event of your life or not. And that's what we're working on, or not. <laughs> because the way it's described to you is the untrained mind. And the way you let go is through your practice steps. So that's your lesson for tonight. And is everybody happy? You gotta nod your heads, okay? <laughs> Is everybody happy now? Yeah? Okay, you're gonna keep smiling. How do you make, oh, here's a quiz. How do you make your smile priceless? Who knows? Come on, who knows? Who knows? Ardika, how do you make your smile priceless? You give it away. You give it away, okay? You find anybody, it's not hard to find people who are not smiling right now, you can find them. Um, it's very easy. But if you smile at them, even for a little while, they feel a lot better. They take it in, they walk with it, and then they use it, okay? I promise I'm gonna come back to Earth. I was just here for tonight. <clears throat> A lot better up here than it is down there sometimes. I wish you could all come and visit. You should all get this picture and just sit there with it once in a while. Turn the lights out in the whole room and imagine you're at the Hilton Hotel in a certain crater on the moon. <laughs> We're just taking a walk. So quiet up here. That's what you need to imagine. Just being quiet. I'll tell you a secret about Bonte before I go. He, he wasn't really a hippie, but he was in that period of time and he was in California. And one of the things they got into was deprivation, you know? And the deprivation thing was Timothy Leary and stuff like that. But this part I'm talking about, they built a shed and um, one, of them, one of them built a shed and painted the inside black and made a platform inside with a chair sitting on the platform. And the platform had a, a canvas chair in a metal frame. And um, the frame was painted with a fluorescent color of orange, okay? And there was a way that you could sit in this chair where your feet were not touching the floor. And then they would turn out the lights and close the door and leave you in there to meditate and you honestly began to feel weightless and you felt like there was nothing there, nothing around you, nothing above you, nothing below you. You couldn't feel the chair. It was sitting on a mat that was cushioned. You couldn't hear anything and just hanging in this hammock in midair. That's what this is all about. That's who you are. Yeah, and from there, you can scale around and smile <laughs> okay <laughs> you try it this week let's share more it okay may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be may the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief 
and all being share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness, may beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.